I can see why chiropractors just get murdered when we start playing this game that was, I don't know who started research. Like who, who, like I was medicine start research. Who started that? You know, and so how do we, how do we communicate it? How mm -hmm. do we know what we can and can't say? And that's a matter of being very careful of not saying too much when chiropractors were making direct claims that getting adjusted would prevent COVID-19, that was problematic mm -hmm. because as much as they knew that in their hearts and theoretically, I don't disagree, they did not have the depth of evidence to defend their statement to those who wanted to discredit them. That's the third level of the paper is, um, I've told you about the other story arcs. This is the overriding story arc. One mistake that we made uh, a couple of years ago was not recognizing the distinction, very important distinction between evidence-based care, evidence-based medicine, and evidence-informed decision-making. What is the difference? Evidence-based care requires you have RCT level evidence. Oh, which we don't have, right? Like that's the kind of research like we really don't have. We have a couple. Okay. We have two or three that are uh, the, the blood pressure study um, and then Julie's study. Those were really beautifully done. Two studies. Hmm. We, you know, it would be helpful to have more, but we also have a bit of a uh, problem designing a lot of research studies. A very simple question, but people with different subluxation patterns, can they be compared? No. Oh, no. No. Oh. And do we have a control group that we know has no subluxation? No. <laughs> Not so given the permutation of subluxations within this human vertebral column, um, and Chris Kent recently did an MRI study on this and showed this concretely, it would be extraordinarily difficult for us to conduct RCTs on a population because of the permutation problem. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, is evidence-based I, I hate using the word medicine, but you know where I'm going. Yes, yes. Evidence-based care, which requires RCT, the most appropriate uh, criteria of uh, limiting your research. And in my opinion, it's not. I think we have a lot of observational studies, cohort studies, case studies, and clinical experience, uh, which should be taken into account. And that's the distinction between evidence-based care and evidence-informed care evidence-based care, you have to have an RCT. If you don't have an RCT, you're wrong. You cannot defend your statement. That's how we got browbeat. Mm -hmm. uh, people didn't recognize that we don't have the depth of evidence according to their criteria, very important dis differentiator, according to their criteria to make our statements. I just, I just so criteria. like, if I'm getting, I just picture like at a dinner party and mm -hmm. uh, this very smart medical doctor goes like, well, you don't have RCTs to practice EBM. And I'd be like, well, I'm not trying to practice EBM. I'm trying to practice E I C. Yeah. Evidence informed. Well, like, I thank you. I, well, he'll be like, oh snap, you just totally schooled me. He'll be like, well, then I don't accept you. Like, can we just say like, well, we don't, we don't care about evidence-based. We're doing evidence informed. Well, we do, we care about both of them. We want to make sure that we're using- I was just being evidence. sassy to that doctor when I know, said, I, I don't do. care. Um, <laughs> I don't so care. I, I agree with what you said. I'm going to add to it a little bit. So if someone were to say, um, huh, I don't know, maybe 25 years ago, my sister, uh, Julie Haas, who was also a PhD, and she's actually a neuroscientist. Uh, when I was in chiropractic school, she- turned to me over uh, Thanksgiving dinner with a group of, I think it was like 12 to 15 family members and turned to me and said, there's no research to support that chiropractic is actually valid. Thanks, Julie. Yeah, it was a great conversation. Everybody at the table was dead silent. And at the time I had, I didn't have an, a, a, a good answer. I just sat there kind of shell-shocked. That's one of the reasons, actually, honestly, I thank her for that. After that time period, I said, do we have enough evidence? And the question that uh, to speak to that uh, with the conversation you're having with your uh, esteemed colleague, your medical doctor over dinner, well, 
okay, so you're requiring that we follow evidence-based practice, but here's the thing, that's not really appropriate for us because we have more permutations than we can control for, for an appropriate RCT. So uh, we are actually expanding our horizons to take into account observational evidence, which is very valid, absolutely. Yes, sometimes it can have some uh, problems with internal bias, I get that. But when you have enough studies that say the same thing, you gotta listen to them. And so that's the distinction, evidence-based is a limitation. Evidence-informed care is a broader reaching assessment of literature as a whole. So if I were to put that a different way, the uh, WFC, when they put out their uh, very flawed um, white paper on, you can't say this because we don't have the right evidence, they were trying to write the rules. They were trying to say, according to our rules, you can't make these statements. And my answer to that is, I don't agree to your rules because they're not appropriate. We need to rethink what those rules should and should not be. And your limited assessment, your limited biased assessment of seven studies that you put forth as evidence that we can't make these statements is unto itself very biased. So you violated your own premise, so to speak. And instead, we need to look at the broader literatures and ask questions like, can this be helpful? So evidence-informed care, I think, is a better paradigm for reading chiropractic literature. And most importantly, because that acknowledges health freedom. That acknowledges patients' right to hear different forms of evidence. It acknowledges our right to speak different forms of evidence and speak of our own clinical experience, because the amount of clinical experience uh, amongst, let's say, roughly 50,000 chiropractors in the U.S. who see this every day, and I do, I do. The reason I feel strongly about the impact of adjustment of vertebral subluxation uh, eliciting non-neuromusculoskeletal events uh, effects is that I see it every day in practice. I have that clinical experience. I see it. No, it's not an RCT, but if we put together 50,000 chiropractors who are all seeing the same thing, that comprises evidence. Let's take a super, super, like, holy fuck, super simple example of that, okay? You're in practice, right? Mm -hmm. You ever see one of your patients sleep better after an adjustment? <laughs> yeah. We're done. Let me explain that a little bit. 50,000 chiropractors, if we all observe that our patients sleep better after adjustments, that comprises clinical evidence, experiential clinical evidence. What does sleep do? Sleep helps to regulate hormone balance. Sleep helps to govern repair and growth, brain health. Sleep is an essential element of human health. If we are impacting a human's ability to achieve deeper or better sleep, we are impacting their overall health. Game over.